For centuries, the Great Pyramids of Giza have remained a conundrum wrapped in an enigma and surrounded by a paradox. Many, many scholars and books have been written about the Great Pyramids of Giza, and the conclusion that all these esteemed authors come to is that some advanced race or lost civilization built these pyramids. But who were they? Hello, I'm Patrick Heron. In this special section of the program, I'm going to be sharing with you the result of almost 20 years research which will show the meaning and the purpose of the Great Pyramid of Giza. These two facts which have so far eluded scholars up until now. But first, let me give you a few facts about the Great Pyramid you may not be familiar with. The Great Pyramid stands in the exact centre of the world, halfway between the North Cape of Norway and the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. It also lies halfway between the east coast of China and the west coast of Mexico, and it intersects the 30th parallel, both latitude and longitude. While its location is startling enough, that is only the beginning of the wonders of this remarkable structure. When the great Greek historian Herodotus first saw the Great Pyramid, and it was already ancient even then, it could be seen gleaming in the sunlight from as far away as the curvature of the earth permitted. Originally, it was finished in a highly polished, smooth white limestone that would have made it impossible to surmount in case anyone should want to try and reach what some experts believe was a capstone of pure gold. The capstone is long gone and only a few of the casing stones remain to give us a sense of the awe-inspiring structure it must have been, even up to the time Napoleon and his army of savants were scrambling to try and figure out how it came about. It is constructed of roughly 2.3 million blocks of stone weighing from 2.5 to 10 tons each. High inside the pyramid are several rose granite blocks weighing in excess of 75 tons. The mind boggles trying to imagine how they got there. It stands 42 storeys high and covers an area the size of 10 football fields. It is an almost solid mass of limestone weighing in excess of 14 billion pounds. Yet in 5,000 years, the Great Pyramid situated on what appears to be a pile of sand has settled less than one half inch. Originally, its radiant structure with its massive covering of highly polished limestone blocks were fitted to tolerances of one two thousandth of an inch, so precise that a razor blade could not be inserted between the joints. It was optical precision on a scale of acres and the Great Pyramid is still the most perfectly aligned structure on Earth, missing true north by only three arc minutes. And in spite of its massive size, it is only out of straight alignment on all four sides by approximately one quarter of an inch. But the Great Pyramid is not only a structural wonder, it is a mathematical wonder as well. The esteemed architect Clarence Larkin came up with the following facts. Taking the Hebrew cubit at 25.025 inches, the length of each side of the Great Pyramid is 365.2422 cubits, which just happens to be the exact length of the solar year. What's more, the solution to the mathematical problem of how to square the circle is incorporated within the geometry of the Great Pyramid of Giza. For centuries, the Great Pyramid was the tallest building in the world and it contains enough stone to build a six-foot wall from New York to Los Angeles. There's even more to this amazing building, but for now, let's see if we can determine what the Great Pyramid has to do with scripture and with end times. There is an obscure verse in the book of Isaiah, which has baffled commentators for many years. Speaking of the last days, Isaiah says, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the middle of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. So this verse is saying that the altar and pillar is both in the border and in the middle of Egypt at the same time. But how can this be? Interestingly, there is only one spot that fits the description of being in the middle of Egypt and at the border at the same time. And that is where the Great Pyramid of Giza now stands. The reference would seem to place the altar and the monument in different places, on the border and in the middle of the land. So how do we come to the conclusion that the Great Pyramid is the fulfilment of that prophecy? As it turns out, the Great Pyramid of Giza is the only monument that fits this qualification of being in the middle of the land of Egypt and at its border at the same time, but only if we have an understanding of ancient geography. 
The Great Pyramid, as we can see, lies at the apex of the triangle created by the Nile Delta. But in ancient times, Egypt was divided into two countries, Lower Egypt, or the Delta, and Upper Egypt. The Great Pyramid sits precisely on this border. Yet this is also the center of the land of Egypt, when the two ancient countries are viewed as one. Isaiah's enigmatic prophecy regarding an altar and a pillar refers specifically to the end times. Its location is fixed, and since the billions of pounds of limestone that makes up the Great Pyramid are not likely to be moved anytime soon, we are left with the conclusion that the Great Pyramid of Giza just might possibly be the altar and pillar Isaiah was referring to. But why? Who would build it for such a purpose? Archaeologists, geologists, mathematicians and scientists of all kinds have probed and measured and studied the Great Pyramid in great detail, but they have yet to come up with a simple answer as to what is its purpose. Even though Egyptologists maintain that the Great Pyramid was nothing more than a burial tomb for the Pharaoh Khufu, the fact of the matter is, no mummy, no body of any kind has ever been found in any pyramid. The so-called sarcophagus that was found in the King's Chamber, for instance. There's no lid for the sarcophagus and there's no way of getting one into the king's chamber or out again. So there is no possible way this could have been used as a burial tomb. The sarcophagus is, however, a perfect representation of a golden rectangle, a mathematical theorem not discovered until thousands of years after the pyramid was built. And the grand gallery leading up to the king's chamber does show evidence of being an ancient observatory, focusing on a particular part of the heavens. And once again, the construction of this massive gallery is accomplished with computer precision. In addition, there are four star shafts, two in the north face and two in the south, each pointing to four specific stars, Orion, Sirius, Beta Ursa Minor and Draco. But why? What would a dead king want with portals to the stars? Ancient Egypt preserved complex beliefs concerning the creation of the world in the little-known Edfu building texts carved into the walls of the Edfu temple in Upper Egypt. These hieroglyphics speak of the Builder Gods, who set out the plans and foundations for all the future pyramids and temples. I think we should take another, more literal look at these hieroglyphics. Certainly they portray giants who are clearly in charge of whatever activity is going on. Could it be that these giants are none other than the offspring of the Nephilim, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, which were thrust down to earth with Lucifer? The scripture describes them as men of great renown as well as giants. Only they had the knowledge, skill and power to create an edifice that would serve as a replica of the heavenly Jerusalem from which they had just been evicted, with its gleaming polished limestone surface and gold capstone. Let's take a closer look at what the scriptures say about the Nephilim. The word Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word Nephal, meaning to fall. Hence the Nephilim means the fallen ones. They are what you and I would call fallen angels, because they fell from grace, fell from heaven and fell to earth. But I don't like the term angel, because when you mention the word angel, people get a mind image of a little naked cherubim with a bow and arrow going around trying to shoot somebody in the heart, or else they think of some guy with 20 foot wings and a big spotlight behind them. But when you get in and study the appearance of angels in the Bible, in fact a better translation would be messenger or agent, they are always depicted as men. They look like men, they dress like men, they eat, they drink, and apparently they can have sexual relations with women. But the difference between angels and men is, we are flesh and blood, whereas they are spirit. We do not know what spirit is, but they are not constrained by the ordinary laws of physics as we are. But they look like us. As it says three times in Genesis and one in the book of James, let us make man in our image, in the image of God made he man. So we look like them, they look like us. That is why very often they have been mistaken as ordinary human beings. We are told in Genesis chapter 6 that an evil band of these rebel fallen angels came to earth, took ordinary human women to wife and had offspring by them. But these were no ordinary offspring, for they were giants in size and also extremely evil and violent. 
and they fill the whole world with their bloodshed and their violence and their evil. These fallen angels and their offspring inhabited the ark for up to a thousand years prior to the flood of Noah. And they so infected the whole of the human race in the earth with their violence and evil that God decided to wipe them all out in what has come to be known as the flood of Noah. Only Noah and his family were saved from the flood at that time. But you cannot drown spirit men. So we are told that these spirit men are locked up in a subterranean prison that has several names in scripture. It is called gloomy dungeons, it is called the abyss, it is called once in the New Testament Tartarus. And of course this ties in with the Tartarus of Greek mythology we are told, where we are told that the gods are imprisoned because they rebelled against Zeus. And this in turn ties in with the abode of the dead or the underworld of Egyptian mythology where we are told that the gods are imprisoned. Any historian will tell you that most mythologies and legends have their basis and their genesis in truth and fact. These fallen angels of Genesis 6 explains where we got all our mythologies from. It's just that the stories have been distorted somewhat as they've come down through the generations. Where it says, the gods came down from heaven, they lived in Mount Olympus in Delphi. Zeus came down and he took Alchemine, a mortal woman to wife, and she almost died giving birth to Hercules. Even though we are told that the Nephilim, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, are locked up in this subterranean prison known as the Abyss or Tartarus, we are also told that in the coming apocalypse they are to be released once again to wreak havoc on an unsuspecting world. But how does all this relate to the Great Pyramid and Isaiah's prophecy? In spite of all the points of argument, there is one thing many experts agree on. And that is that physically, mathematically and scientifically, the Great Pyramid of Giza simply could not have been built by humans. Experts and engineers today freely admit that even with all our technology and machinery, we could not build the Great Pyramid today to the same size and specifications. But somebody did, and there was someone on the earth who did a lot of other remarkable things. Not far away, in a place called Baalbek in Lebanon, lies the Temple of Jupiter. This looks like your typical Greek temple with its columns etc etc. But there are three huge cut stone foundation blocks there which weigh up to 900 tons each. This is the same weight as two and a half jumbo jets together. And lying out on the ground not far away is another huge cut stone block which is a thousand tons weight. This is the combined weight of three jumbo jets and this is called the Stone of the South. And we do not possess a machine in the world today that could lift that block and move it to another place. Yet we are asked to believe that ancient Egyptians, or perhaps their predecessors, wandering in the desert some five and a half millennia ago, built this amazing edifice and yet the wheel had not yet been invented. This is a bit like saying that if you give a screwdriver to a chimpanzee he's going to build a television set for you. Surely there is a better answer to the riddle. Could the answer be found in the writings of the ancient prophets? Let's diverge here for just a moment and take a closer look at how prophecy works. The great difference between the Bible and any other book ever written, either profane or religious, is that about 30% of the Bible is prophetic. That is, it is telling you things that are going to happen before they do. So either the veracity of the Bible is proven by the fulfillment of these prophecies, or if they are not fulfilled, then it is proven false and you can throw it in the bin. Thus far, about 85% of all the prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. This can be said of no other book in the world. For instance, in the last 24 hours of the life of the Messiah, 25 specific prophecies came to pass. And all these were written from 500 to 1000 years BC. It was prophesied that he would be betrayed by his friend. It was prophesied that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, it was prophesied that his friend would commit suicide, it was prophesied that they would gamble over his seamless garment, it was prophesied that they would stick a spear in his side and blood and water would come out, etc, etc. 25 specific prophecies were fulfilled in this one man's life in one 24 hour period. Mr. Grant Jeffrey, a Canadian scholar, did an experiment. He took just 11 of the prophecies that were written about the Messiah and he apportioned probability to each of these prophecies. For instance, 
It says in Micah 5.2 that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now Beth Bethlehem was a very small, insignificant village in the middle of nowhere in the backwater of the Roman Empire. Usually when kings or messiahs are born, they would be born in the capital city. So because there was thousands of villages there at this time, he said, well, we'll make this 200 to 1 that he's born in Bethlehem. Then he took another prophecy that the messiah would ride into Jerusalem on an ass's colt. Well, kings don't usually go around riding on an ass's colt, so he gave this a, as a probability of 50 to 1. So the combined probability of these two prophecies coming to pass in this one man's life were 50 by 200, which is 10,000 to, to 1. Jeffrey continued on in this vein, assigning conservative probability to each of these 11 prophecies. When he worked out the combined probability of all these things coming to pass in the life of one man, it worked out at one chance in 10 billion times a billion. In other words, a st statistical impossibility. In order to illustrate this point, let me give you another analogy. Suppose for a moment I took a ring from your finger. Then I went up in an aeroplane and I flew over the seven oceans of the world and somewhere over one of these seas I opened the window and threw out your ring. Then I came back to you and I said to you, here's a boat and a fishing rod. Off you go on your journey. When you are feeling lucky, you have one chance to let down your hook and locate that ring. This is the same chance you would have of 11 of these prophecies coming to pass in the life of the Messiah with the conservative probabilities that Grant Jeffrey assigned to these prophecies. In other words, it's a statistical impossibility. Yet, he only took 11 of these pro prophecies. The Messiah filled 109 specific prophecies in his short life. 85% of all the prophecies of the Bible have already been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. So there is just 15% of the prophecies left to be fulfilled in the future. And these shall be fulfilled with the same mathematical accuracy and precision as the original 85%. So what does the Bible say about the signs of the coming apocalypse? In Matthew 24, the Messiah was asked a very interesting question by his, some of his closest friends. They said to him, what will be the signs of the end of this age and of your coming? And he replied, You will hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be an increase in famines, in earthquakes, in disease, in the wind and the sea raging, in immorality, in lawlessness, etc. In Luke 21, 25 it says, There will be signs in the sun, moon and stars. On the earth nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. It is obvious that this sign has come to pass recently with the devastation caused by the tsunami in Asia and with the devastating hurricanes which have hit the southeast of the United States of America. In Revelation chapter 8 we read, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood, and a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. What is the likelihood of this prophecy being fulfilled? As a matter of fact, there is an active supervolcano in the Canary Islands just off the north coast of Africa. It makes up the greater part of the island of La Palma. Scientists tell us that it is not a matter of if, but when this volcano will blow. When it does, they expect it to cause a tidal wave 500 feet high, traveling at the speed of a passenger jet. At that rate, it will reach the east coast of the United States in as little as eight or nine hours, with a massive wall of water 75 to 180 feet high. By contrast, the tsunami that hit Asia was only 18 to 20 feet high. Imagine triple this devastation in some of the most densely populated areas in the world. And that doesn't take into account the damage done to marine life in the ocean as the flaming mountain flows into the sea, nor the destruction to any ships that might get caught in the massive wave. Our scientists seem to be telling us that not only can these prophecies be fulfilled 
it is almost a certainty that they will be. But these are things we can expect to see in the future. Are there prophecies we have actually seen fulfilled in the lifetime of our generation? Christ himself told his disciples that this generation, that is the generation that sees and recognizes the signs, will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Scores of prophecies said that the Jews would be kicked out of Palestine and Israel, that they would be scattered to the four corners of the world, and that everywhere they would go, they would be persecuted and despised of all peoples. In 70 AD, a Roman general named Titus went in to put down an insurrection in Jerusalem. He slaughtered about a million Jews and the rest were scattered to the four corners of the earth, hence the wandering Jew. And everywhere this people have gone, they've been despised and persecuted and hated of all nations, which culminated in the Holocaust in Germany in the Second World War. But there are many, many other prophecies that say in the last days, in the last generation, that God would regather his people and establish them in Palestine once again. And at the beginning of the last century, some Jewish people started going back and then some more. And in 1948, Israel was recognized as a state for the first time since their 2000 year worldwide scattering. So when you go home and switch on the TV, and you see trouble in Palestine between the Jews and the Palestinians, you are watching this prophecy coming to pass. We are the generation that have seen the return of the Jews to Israel, so therefore I believe that we are in the generation of the last days. In chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, John describes a future city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven to earth. John describes this future city, the New Jerusalem, in great detail. Its brilliance was like a precious jewel, and the angel measured it with a golden rod. We are told of all the various stones it's made out of. We are told it has 12 gates made out of a single pearl each, and that the river of life flows out from the midst of it, etc. And at the end of this detailed description, John gives us the dimensions of this future city, and he says its length and its breadth and its height are the same. In today's measurements, that would be 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, and 1,500 miles wide. This measurement has led many scholars to believe that the New Jerusalem is a cube, but there is one other geometric model that fits the criteria, and this is a pyramid. The Edfu texts repeatedly state that the monuments of Egypt were built by the gods to represent buildings in the sky. So when the Nephilim fell to earth all those thousands of years ago, they built the Great Pyramid of Giza with its gleaming white limestone. They built this incredible monument as an earthly representation of the celestial city they had come from. In John chapter 14, the Messiah made a statement which will be well known to most people. He said, in my father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Then later on, in the book of Hebrews, it speaks about Abraham, and it said he looked for a city in heaven whose builder and maker was God. And in Corinthians, Paul says that we have an eternal house in the heavens whose architect was God, and it was not made by human hands. So when we talk about the city in Revelation chapter 1, which John described as the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, this is what the Messiah was talking about. This is where he went. This future new Jerusalem is a pyramid in shape. There is no question that the Great Pyramid is a truly unique and remarkable, some would say miraculous structure certainly worthy of being an altar and pillar to the Lord. Taking all the evidence into account, it seems clear that the Great Pyramid of Giza is an earthly representation of the future New Jerusalem, the heavenly city which is to come down out of heaven from God. So when Isaiah spoke about an altar and pillar, he was referring to the Great Pyramid of Giza. And it's this great pyramid of Giza which is pointing forward into the future at this future pyramid city as described in great detail in chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. And this future New Jerusalem is pointing back 
at the Great Pyramid of Giza. There is a direct connection between the two. When the Messiah spoke of the signs of the last days, he said that it would be like a woman in labour pains. So what we are seeing now are what I call the shadows of the apocalypse. The world is a time bomb whose fuse has long since been lit. The hoofbeats of the four horsemen of the apocalypse are clearly to be heard by all those who have ears to hear. The bad news is the Titanic is going down. The good news is you don't have to get on it. For there's an escape route, there's a way out, there is an alternative. For we are promised that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Great Pyramid is a sign and a witness of the coming New Jerusalem, the heavenly abode of the living God, which will be the capital city of the new heaven and earth yet to come in the future. The riddle of the pyramid has been solved. The only question remaining is, when will it all begin?